hour. We've got a, um, a really good panel uh, on the rise of the smart TV. Uh, I know, uh, like a lot of you, we've been listening to this conference about uh, how big Android and iOS and all these other platforms and how rapidly they've been growing. But um, the, uh, the connected in, in, in smart TV is, is likewise on a very strong trajectory. And this panel today is going to cover uh, what's happening today and where it's going. Um, I'd like to introduce Paul Noasad. He's the VP of Transgaming, uh, and uh, he has been in the uh, TV and gaming business for quite a while. Uh, worked for um, he's worked for both Yahoo, uh, Disney, and uh, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming um, Company. Uh, done a lot of work with various ISPs or, uh, in Canada and other other places. Uh, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can introduce the rest of your panel, and we're going to hear a lot about uh, a new platform uh, that's not uh, 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 a phone. <laughs> wow. I hope it's not a bubble. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce, uh, really, the, the, the first part is to try to give you a sense of what smart TV, connected TV, um, really is, and then uh, some of the, the people in this space, um, Anthony and Savan, will speak. They're, representing two different companies as well as I'll tell you a little bit about what Trends Gaming is doing in this space. Um, so we'll just kind of kick it off and keep things moving. So what is Smart TV? Um, there's a lot of different names, a lot of different monikers it goes by. Obviously CES this year, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas brought um, a lot of these big names uh, or generic terms like Smart TV to the forefront. Um, it can be a connected device, meaning a, a TV, a Blu-ray player, anything that has the ability to connect to the internet and then deliver additional content beyond just a linear uh, video image. It could be a set-top box with new technology, and it could be a variety of other devices. So it gives you a, a pretty big landscape, and there's a lot of main players in this space. And I think in this space, what we're doing um, is trying to look at, you know, how did we get here, and then uh, give you a sample of kind of where we're at and then where we're going. So this market is very, very similar. Uh, we look at, you know, smart TV, how did we get here? We look at smartphones. So smartphones is something we all take for granted. Um, really 2007, 2008, it's when we really got into this space. And now you can see as of last year, we're seeing this market and the smartphone market growing 50% um, versus the year before and 21% um, was the, the total mobile phone market. So it's outpacing just mobile phones. <coughs> People have a choice of taking you know, cell calls or having a full featured phone that does a bit more. They're obviously leading the consumer demand towards full featured phones. And then you're seeing major aggregators in the space. You're seeing um, the iOS market, um, the Android market, obviously a BlackBerry, um, and a few other players. You're seeing consolidation in the space as well. And you're going to see that similar trend in the smart TV space. So the apps is really what drives, um, or it's the terminology that drives what people consider a smartphone. It can do more than just take calls. It can do more than just calling you know, kind of within your own cell network. Um, you can see since 2008, it's really uh, a giant hockey stick, and that's just what you want to see in a marketplace. Um, there are probably more apps than anyone could possibly download in a lifetime that are available to you, but the key is people are developing for this market, people are interested in this market, and this is a market that is definitely being led by games, interactive books, um, pretty much d digital content. So how do you get here? There's really, you know, there's a variety of key components that drive this market. We've kind of summarized, you know, four key aspects that need to exist. They exist in the smartphone market. They exist now in the smart TV market. First, you need the, the hardware needs to be there. We really haven't had the hardware there until uh, just recently. That brings you a CPU and a GPU into the space, allows devices to be more intelligent, allows them to handle 3D graphics, allows them to do a lot of things um, that they weren't capable of in the past. You need connectivity. You need better control schemes. Um, the controls that originally were in the mobile phone or smartphone market are very different than what we see today, and we take for granted how quickly those evolved. You're seeing that evolution again in the control schemes within the TV um, space. And then you need kind of an open SDK. And what we mean by that is just the ability to have tools that can be in the hands of developers, that can be in the hands of the creativity, and allows there to be no bottleneck for games or content that you want to bring into this space, and allows that to kind of mature over time. So connected devices, you know, 2008, it's really kind of hard to maybe see 2008 to 2010. All you really need to see is the purple bar graph is larger than the other ones. And the trend right now is that more things in your home are being connected. It started with consoles, especially in the North American market. It's now adding Blu-ray. You're adding TVs. You're adting pretty much everything that you buy on a consumer electronics basis has the ability to be connected. And there's a vast difference between connected and smart, but, you know, it's heading in that general direction. Because of that change, you're actually seeing daily use 
um, being pretty significant, given the fact that we're just starting to kind of take off with this level of connectivity. There's tw still 20% of the marketplace um, that's looking and actively using a connected device in some way, shape, or form on a daily basis, and about a third on a weekly basis. As those numbers continue to improve, you'll obviously see greater and greater frequency um, on, on a consumer's uh, behavior. So this is kind of the biggest telling curve, um, and it doesn't really matter what the numbers are, even though they're pretty significant, they're in the hundreds of millions of devices. You're seeing significant movement in Western Europe, a very competitive landscape. You're seeing movement in the US market, and you're seeing movement in the Asia-Pac market. And these are markets that are embracing the new hardware, they're embracing new standards, they're embracing the connectivity that is available to them, and delivering consumers different experiences over the next three to four years. The great part about this space, and in the smart TV or connected device space, is it's mirroring a lot of the other spaces. So interactive content is really what people want to see. They want to see video games, they want to see interactive books, they want to see um, you know, music and movies and VOD, and they want that power to be within that space, similar as the other devices. So obviously the gaming industry has a huge opportunity here to deliver on that promise. So where that puts us today is you have OEMs, and OEMs would be people like Samsung, LG, Panasonic, and, and a wide variety of others that are creating more connected devices um, and delivering them to market by, I think it's 53 million to 37 million versus game consoles. So you're seeing this market, which is very pervasive, we take for granted consumer electronics, significantly outpacing a niche market. And it's very similar to what you mentioned before. In the previous talk, where you have web browsers significantly outpacing consoles, now you have connected devices starting to significantly outpace um, consoles. The numbers, again, are, are pretty significant. Some of the forecasts, 1.8 billion connected devices. That includes tablets and everything else. It's pretty much, if, it, if you buy it, it's electric. You expect it to be able to connect. You expect it to be able to, to give you value beyond what it is today. That's the trend we're, we're heading towards. So what we have here is we have uh, Anthony Johnson from PlayJam, uh, Sven, and I won't even try to, to butcher your last name. I apologize. Um, from, from G Cluster, and then I'll, I'll speak after. And really what we're going to show you is these are some services um, in the video game and interactive content space that have set themselves up within this smart TV or connected TV marketplace that allows content that you developers can create, allows it to be distributed, allows it to be um, a part of an ecosystem that we really believe over the next you know, three to four years is going to be in the hundreds of millions of connected devices. And then you'll start to see that aggregation on operating systems, aggregation on opportunities. Um, and the, the customer will always win in this space. The key is to figure out how you can participate kind of in the early days and then ramp up as that hockey stick takes off over the next you know, 18 to 36 months. Cool. So, Anthony? So, good afternoon. Um, I am the Commercial Director at PlayJam. We've been um, creating and distributing games specifically for TV uh, for the past 11 years, uh, mainly for pay TV networks, uh, Sky in the UK, Virgin, um, and UPC across Europe. Um, and we're at this crossroads now where we're shifting very heavily towards kind of smart TV as a platform. And we're very excited about the opportunity there. Um, predicting the future is always very difficult, but what we do know is that smartphones have really led the revolution in terms of um, delivering content to users. And as such, um, TV is going through a monumental change at present. We see um, the major consumer electronic manufacturers having a kind of a real shift in thinking from moving from basically pure manufacturing companies that deliver products at you know, relatively low margins to ones which kind of are identifying the opportunity of controlling and distributing content that people are able to view on those devices. Um, to the extent that the, the large manufacturers such as Samsung, LG, Sony, Panasonic have um, invested significant funds in developing open platforms um, over which people are able to deliver this content. Um, specifically um, in sort of areas like such as software uh, to create an environment where you can have really rich and compelling games um, um, uh, pr promoted to the user as well as hardware and I think some of that was touched upon by Paul earlier but um, I'll go over it very quickly again faster silicon so faster processing power more memory and very important I think for the gaming community a better input control devices um, we see already LG shipping uh, their connected TVs um, a standard with uh, what they call their Magic Motion Remote, which is basic gesture recognition, um, and that's great for gaming. Um, and companies such as Philips, really, who are really investing quite heavily in this, in this area. And if you 
go to Trans Gaming's um, uh, store on the, in the uh, Platinum section, you see a really good implementation of UWAND um, with their UI. They're a competitor, I shouldn't really be saying that, but it's, it's a fantastic implementation. Um, TV, connected TV, it's definitely happening now. Um, Samsung have released some figures a couple of months ago, um, having come out of soft launch about the same time. They launched the platform back in um, February 2010, um, and their figures showed that um, as of two months ago, they had their five millionth app downloaded, um, which is a great figure. But I think more importantly, um, the trend um, in terms of the, the volume of apps uh, being downloaded on a daily basis is really interesting. So um, the time it took to download 100,000 applications back when they launched uh, last year was around 18 days. Um, and this just short shortened very significantly to four days. So we really see that really interesting J curve, which is very positive. Um, in addition to this, they also um, very helpfully um, released statistics around um, the percentage by volume of applications being downloaded on their platform. And by far and away, the most um, was games um, in terms of 24%. In fact, it was very closely followed by a genre called education, which when you look at is actually basically games for, um, for, for the younger market um, at 23%. But like iOS, um, it's really shown that games are um, playing a really significant part of the overall product mix on connected TV. There are loads of figures bounding about um, in terms of what the projected footprint of connected TV could be, um, from half a billion all the way to um, ABI research, which is saying three billion devices by two, 2015. Um, we usually work to um, Parks Associates research, which has proved itself to be relatively um, accurate, um, and they're projecting by 2015 a billion devices. And that's not just uh, connected TVs, but also peripheral devices um, such as Blu-ray player. Um, and I think it's important to try and put that into context a little bit. Um, a billion devices effectively twice the user base of um, currently of Facebook, and 40 to 50 times the user base of Comcast, who's one of um, the US's most established cable providers. Um, and the point I think I'm trying to make here, uh, the serious point, is that if you take LG and Samsung's combined um, forecaster shipments, they can ship in one quarter what Comcast has taken you know, many, 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 many years to grow in terms of a user base. Um, it's all well and good saying that there'll be a billion devices out there um, by 2015, but what I think is really key is of those connectable devices, how many are actually being connected. And it's actually difficult to get those statistics out of the manufacturers at the moment. They're holding the cars very close to their chest. It's a very embryonic market at the moment. But from the research companies that we speak to and the contacts that we have, um, we see kind of a range of between 25 and 50 percent, depending on the manufacturer and the region in terms of connectivity rates. Um, of those polled, 21 percent um, list games as a motivating factor to connect their set. Um, but more interestingly, once the set is connected, up to 47% of the users will actually go on to play a game. Um, so I've drawn some comparisons, some of them wild comparisons with iOS and, and, and Facebook and the likes of that. But I think it's also really important to kind of um, identify what is very different in terms of gaming on, on via TV um, versus um, a, a platform such as iOS. And that is essentially that TV offers um, a very laid back experience. If you contrast this with um, trying to find games and play games on iOS, which is a platform that hosts currently, and I don't know if these figures are still up to date, but the last time I looked, had 75,000 games live on the platform at any one time, 90, day, uh, 90 games a day being uploaded. Um, this is um, you know, a challenge to sort through content rise, even if you're sitting in front of a PC with a mouse or have a sophisticated touch, um, touch screen device. But it's absolutely impossible to do with a standard remote control on television. So um, the, um, using sort of the experience that we've garnered over the last 10, 11 years in delivering games via pay TV networks, um, we feel that the, um, uh, the approach should be much more editorially led. So that means providing the user with a number of options of games to play that we think um, would be suitable to them, and that would be based on their past user behavior and any other sort of statistics that we can garner from, from the platform. I think I'll skip that slide. Um, so moving on to some of the, uh, the data, and I, I, I kind of 
um, preface this with the fact that this is data taken from pay TV networks, and that doesn't automatically mean that this will translate equally to smart TV, um, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, the kind of um, demographics with pay TV, for uh, people playing games on pay TV, is very similar to those actually watching TV. So there's a female skew. Um, we have um, a, a, an average age between 35 and 45 years old. Um, but interestingly, um, those play jammers which come back to our service will play, um, just on the 50% uh, will play more than one game a day on the service. So there's a real high propensity for people to go out and actually play games on TV. Um, what's their motivation? Well, it varies really from filling in time between programs, um, boredom, but mainly it's because people love to play games. Um, we take analytics um, extremely seriously. Um, it really helps us, especially in an editorially-led proposition, to be able to deliver relevant content. So um, we know, for example, in the UK that between the hours of 9 uh, a.m. and 5 p.m., we have mainly women um, playing games on the service, and they like puzzles. Um, this kind of data allows us, therefore, to promote um, more puzzle games over this exact time frame and therefore um, generate uh, far more revenue than were we to uh, put a much more kind of varied mix um, up at any one time. And we would typically split the day into four sections, which would be preschool, uh, daytime, evening, uh, and, and late night, and then uh, distribute the, uh, the right content accordingly. Um, the other kind of statistics where I think that might surprise you, um, and there's a big caveat on this, um, is that on our pay TV networks, we've actually managed to get to a conversion rate from free to pay of actually 48%, which, is, which I know is astronomical in terms of um, what you might see on other platforms. Um, and, and I would um, kind of put this into context by saying we have, um, this is taken from our Sky TV platform, which has an extremely low friction um, uh, uh, billing mechanism, which effectively doesn't, uh, which effectively enables the user um, to be able to press one button and um, uh, be charged a, a small sum um, immediately via a premium rate phone number. Um, so it's very, very low friction. Um, on smart TV platforms, that's slightly different. The platform that we've launched is, is global, so we, we have to have a global billing system in place, which is an account-led system, which would require the user to register their details and put their payment cards in once. So we would expect to see that 48% drop quite significantly. Um, but what it does show is that where there is a low friction um, kind of model in terms of billing, um, there's a real, not only is there a high propensity of people to play games, but there's a real high propensity of people to actually pay for that content. Um, we have average, average unique repeat purchases per month of 4.8, and an average um, revenue per paying user of um, just over $6. So, um, kind of to bring to this to an end, I'll just give a, a, a small view of where we think the roadmap is currently. Um, we have rolled out with Samsung, we're rolling out with LG in a couple of weeks, um, Panasonic in September, and, and we have a presence already on Sony. Um, the two um, kind of biggest um, manufacturers, LG and, and Samsung, are supporting kind of flashlight environment, which means we're able to run a very simple um, games um, based in, written in AS2. Um, from the beginning, so end of this year, beginning of next year, they will start to implement Adobe's um, uh, Air 2.5 and 3.0 runtime environment, which has been specifically purposed for TV, and will enable us to be able to run um, AS3 games, which means taking games that you can currently play um, on your browser, assuming that they're able to, um, to work with a standard remote control. Um, and then over time, we see cloud gaming is becoming a very big part um, um, of this kind of um, ecosystem. And um, in fact, uh, uh, Sevan there from G Cluster um, will give you, be able to give you lots of details about that. He's doing some great things um, through his company there in, in France. So that's really it. That's where I'm from. If there are any game developers in the house who are interested in porting to Smart TV, any Flash game developers, then I'd be really interested in speaking with them after the show. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. So I'm Seven Kessissian, Vice President of uh, G Cluster. 
Um, so few slides uh, for the audience, and then uh, I will have a short demo uh, of what we are doing on connected TVs uh, in Europe. Uh, so I would like to talk about basically the evolution of uh, gaming. So it's coming from, it used to be hardware, it used to be expensive hardware. Uh, you know, the content was expensive, it was long to develop. Um, the audience of video games used to be, you know, uh, teenagers, people who are very hardcore, very involved in the game. As many of you know, this has been evolving to what I call the casual gaming phenomena with games that, I mean, uh, indeed, it's, the, it's a very fast-growing segment uh, on the market. Uh, the development time for this content is lower than for hardcore games. The price point is also lower. And uh, uh, the audience, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a low personal investment for people who are playing casual games. It doesn't mean that they don't play a lot. They play a lot, but it's less, I would say, um, it requires less... Um, energy uh, to do something fun um, when you play casual games. And all this universe is now connecting to what, what we call connected screens um, and to new connected services. Some of them are completely social, like Facebook and Zynga. Some of them are based on subscription, like uh, World of Warcraft. And uh, all, the, all these services are going on TV, but they are also going on smartphone and they are going on tablet. Still, um, there's one issue in, in those, those three points is that for no, for, for no game right now, none of those games have been able to give one connected uh, and one, I would say, universal experience of gaming on the different screens. You always have the old version on mobile, you have the version on TV, you have your version on smartphone. How do you solve this? How do, how do you bring this? And what we believe is that J-Cluster is this layer that is going to uh, solve this equation for the content publishers. So one thing uh, is a fact is since a long time, uh, since TV exists, everybody wants to go on TV. Uh, so we have here on the right some example of uh, some companies who are giving great service, uh, giving bandwidth, and we have uh, players who want to go over the top and who want to conquer the TV. Companies like Netflix, companies like YouTube who are doing great. We have also companies like OnLive, and all those um, people are taking the margins and they are taking the revenues. So it's not fun for the carriers. What we have done in France is we have been partnering with one of those guys, SFR, and um, basically they are delivering a cloud gaming service uh, since October, and it's probably the biggest deployment uh, for cloud gaming in the world currently. So our service uh, that I'm going to show uh, in a few seconds is based on four very simple principles. It has to be easy, it has to be entertaining, it has to be affordable, and it has to be social and connected. So what we do, uh, like uh, also what uh, the guys from GameTree and PlayJam are doing is that we remove the need to have a hardware so people don't have to, uh, to, to own a game console in order to access entertainment and a great gaming, uh, gaming service. And also it's very cheap. Uh, you can pay uh, the service for 4.99 euro every month or for 9.99 euro every month. So I'm just going to show you what I'm talking about. So what we have here is a, a standard TV, and we have a set-top box uh, that has been manufactured by a company called NetGem. So you have uh, 3 million of those set-top boxes that are currently on the market in France. It's as, as much as the PlayStation 3 in France. And from actually you know, one day to another, we have been giving access to 3 million of households to interactivity and to great gaming experience that is focused on casual games. So what you have here is uh, the channel that, uh, that is uh, with SFR. So you have uh, basically the ability to create uh, a profile. For all the games that are displayed here, uh, you have contextual information. Uh, is the game playable with the gamepad? Is the game playable with the remote controller? So here, Diana is, uh, is using the gamepad. But we will show you also some games that are playable uh, very simply uh, with the, the remote control. So, Diana, maybe we could show um, something like Tower Blocks, for example. So, uh, what's funny is that uh, those three million households 
uh, that are using a cloud gaming service, they don't really know that it's a cloud gaming service. Many of them think that the games are run locally. So what's happening here is that we have a server that is behind the TV that is processing the games. And this is all streamed uh, in real time to the people. So you don't have anything to install. Uh, as you see, the game is starting uh, directly. So there's, no, uh, uh, there's nothing uh, else to do than to press start and to, uh, to enjoy the games. So we'll just show you um, a little bit of gameplay. I'm sure you know this game, so it's very simple, but it's still rich and using 3D uh, components. Voila, so you rebuild uh, a city and, and, and people are happy, and actually uh, the customers are spending crazy amount of time. So one of the games we launched uh, last week, it's four elements from Playrix, and there is one person who has been playing the game for six hours, nonstop. So that's quite amazing, but... Uh, and so at any time, you can come back to the interface and you can pause the game. And, and the beauty is one, one new thing that I'm going to show today is that uh, from the same server that you are seeing here, uh, we are able to stream actually the same service on a smartphone. And we are uh, able also to play, for example, tour blocks in multiplayer between this phone and between this TV uh, locally or remotely. So that's basically one of the, one, one of the benefits of uh, the cloud gaming technology. So I'm going to continue uh, with the slides. And so, so this has been launched in October, and this is nothing is happening on the box. So we are constantly updating uh, the service. So every month we are bringing new features. So we have now the friends, we have the ranking system. Uh, you can rate, basically, uh, the games that you like. So that's basically uh, uh, what we are building. And what's very interesting is that uh, we are talking about the TV uh, for this panel, but we are uh, going to launch the service on smartphones, on tablets, uh, and also on PC uh, in a couple of weeks. And it's the same J-Cluster core technology that is working for the gaming service, or that is, it, can, it can work for cloud video on demand services like we do on the Japanese market, or for any new services uh, that are connected. So just to talk about a few numbers, because it's important uh, for developers, of course. Uh, you have to monetize your game. So uh, basically, we have 300,000 uh, households who have been playing the game service. Uh, what is very interesting is that people go for the premium. So 65% uh, of the users are going for, for the 10 euro package. So they want to have the, the better experience. They are ready to pay for that. That's very important. They spend a lot of time playing the service, five hours per month as an average. And we have a very good conversion ratio, which is of 6%. So it's, it's very different from what Anthony has. But uh, it means that 6% of the people who are playing a game, who are playing tour blocks, for example, are becoming subscribers. And um, uh, we have now uh, uh, several, several thousand people, uh, I would say half a, half a baseball stadium, who is paying uh, every month uh, 10 bucks uh, to play casual games. So that's, that's pretty cool. And the way we, mon we monetize this is, uh, uh, so we do the subscription, we have a digital distribution, which means that you can uh, download your game and, and, uh, and buy, buy the game full price. Uh, we have the paper play, which is uh, $2.99, $1.99, or you can have a specific channel with your, with your content. Um, and the value chain, just to explain to you how it's working uh, from a business model standpoint, so you have the end users, you have the carrier, in this case it's SFR, J-Cluster, and the game publisher. So we are partnering with the biggest carriers globally. And the revenue model is based, it's very fair, is based on the performance of your games. Uh, so if, you're, if you, your games are doing great on the service, people spend time on it, then you will make a lot of money. So we are working with uh, more than 30 studios currently, and we have more than 200 games in our catalog. We are adding one new game every week on the service, and uh, uh, we'll be very happy to, to listen uh, to any publisher who has interesting content for connected TVs, and uh, we'll be glad to start monetizing them. Thank you. Well, Maybe, maybe not. Perfect. 
Oh, thank you. So that gives you a, a little bit of a sense. We'll give you a sense of what Game Tree TV is doing. It's a trans gaming's offering. There's also on the main floor, uh, there's a booth. There's two setups. You can go, you can play with it. It has the, the Philips controller. It's showing you kind of how uh, the control schemes have really changed and are changing in this space. And I think it gives you a real good flavor. You can see some of the, the variety of content from Nickelodeon and Playrix and, and PopCap and the like. So our position in this space um, is, is to be the premier on-demand um, video game platform in the space. Um, the entire platform, I guess you could coin it as an app. Um, some people consider games apps, and that's typically a mobile or an internet base. In the TV space and in a lot of these new connected space, the aggregators or the people providing the social kind of community that wraps around content that's familiar is more considered the app. And so Game Tree TV is positioning itself as um, a premier player of putting together top quality content that makes sense within the TV landscape to allow you to uh, you know, interrupt or when there's nothing on TV, play an interactive experience with, on your own with usually there's more than one person in the room, so a family. Um, typical demographics of, of mom lead, family participates. So the, the real key drivers for our platform are kind of fourfold. Um, the primary one is for this to be a fully integrated experience. It's a turnkey solution that allows a OEM um, or a cable operator to integrate this opportunity into their service as they put out um, a next generation set top box or a next generation smart TV. It allows the consumer to have a single point of entry and have a very clear value proposition and a consistency behind the brand for the content. The library of content that we have um, is constantly growing. I mean, the key is to put fresh content in, not put a whole bunch of content and then have it kind of sit there. That's kind of the old model. The new model is to create a viral community, put top tier brands in there, to put content that really makes sense for the space. And therefore, we really have an open, pro, open uh, content developer community. So we have published SDKs. We have access to emulators. It allows developers like yourselves to get access to the tools, to get as close as you can to bringing content to this platform. But the real key is to try to make sure it's not porting, it's not heavy lifting. It's taking existing IP, it's taking existing concepts and streamlining them over to this platform. And the last piece, which is probably the biggest piece for us, is to program the platform. Um, you have different aggregated opportunities and then you have programmed opportunities. Something like an HBO On Demand it actually tells you what you probably should be watching. Similar to a network, when you go to NBC, ABC, or CBS, you will watch reruns. You will watch shows that you've seen before because it's being programmed to you at the time of day and, and to, the, to the audience. I don't think an interactive on-demand solution should really kind of sidestep that, that opportunity. So you still want to have your content raised up. You still want to be able to tie into seasonal events. You still want to be able to present new opportunities to customers and allow them to experience in the TV landscape, which is a sit back, relax, entertain me type environment with a level of interactivity, not forcing me to search through hundreds of thousands of apps like you would potentially in a mobile or internet based space. The demographic, as you've seen, we're all kind of you know, aligning and it, it makes a lot of sense. Your TV viewer, your TV viewer is you know, a family viewer. It's not necessarily a hardcore gamer. Great part about hardcore gamers is they will find the place to play. If there's games in this platform and they like it, they'll play here. If they want to play on the console, they'll play here. This is really geared up to fill more like the snack gaming market that you're seeing in the mobile space. There's a lot of time that people participate um, in front of their TV. It's about six plus hours in the US and there's a lot of opportunity there to engage them in a more interactive opportunity. The real differentiator that we believe is we understand that as a content creator, you have to start with something that has viability and profitability. And therefore, you're usually either a PC uh, based gamer or at the roots of a PC gamer. So you have a D3D or DirectX type game. You're maybe a mobile gamer. So you have more of an OpenGL ES type you know, graphics path game or an embedded iOS game. Um, and you need to be able to start with those SKUs and quickly and easily bring those um, in weeks, not months, to this platform. And that's why we've set up with our SDK and our toolkits. The other thing that we're looking at doing is building deeper relationships with content um, enablers. So engine companies, uh, framework companies, to allow runtimes to be created very easily the very same way that they're being created for other mobile platforms or for consoles today. If you can use a similar set of tools that guarantees you a good quality experience, you'll be more apt to bring good quality content day and date um, to a TV environment than you will to console, PC, or mobile. Lastly, we're in market today um, in France actually with uh, a competitor to SFR. So uh, France, as you will quickly learn in this space, um, is a pretty fast mover. It's a very competitive landscape in Western Europe. 
Um, Western Europe has a very deregulated approach um, to the cable industry, similar to the mobile industry. So customers are, are, I guess, more important. And in the North American market, we look at more of an over-the-top service. The service has been very, very successful in a very short period of time. And the big keys that we're seeing is a reoccurring customer base of about 33%. Um, we're on a weekly basis. We're seeing a loyalty to people. We're seeing people jumping into the different price point opportunities um, that we offer. And we're seeing content being added at a pretty rapid rate. We have 48% new content since the day we launched. So it's a continual evolving opportunity um, for the customer. And therefore, it's got a very low friction because it's integrated directly with a cable operator. So I'll give you a little demo of what it's like. And then again, you can see it on the floor. This is a little bit of a movie. Hopefully no volume. So the, what you'll see here in the UI um, that we've set up is we have an experience that's, that's a platform. It takes over the screen. It gives you the immersive opportunity. You can jump into Game Tree TV the same way you would jump into an HBO on demand type channel experience. Um, it allows you to be programmed and have content served up to you. You can see what's new. You can see what we're promoting. Um, the tiles or the pedals as it moves out allows us to add a tremendous amount of content allows us to categorize and, and show that content. It's an interactive TV. It needs to have video. It needs to have audio. It needs to speak to you. Um, so the way in which we've set it up is that it is kind of like what you would expect um, within the TV landscape. The other great thing is we can categorize content from key developers. So we can take content, um, in this case, from PopCap, and we can create a sub-channel, no different than you would have like a Disney channel, and you can create the content so that it has a home it may be for a period of time, it may be for a promotion, but it's easy for the customer. For kids, kids' brands, people who like different types of TV show content, it allows them to have a very clear understanding of where the content is, because you shouldn't be having to search too hard for content. Once you decide what kind of content you want, you can jump into the page, you can see what the age uh, range is for that content, you could rate that content if you've already played it, and best, when you go in to interact with the content, everything is on a rental model. There's no desire to have content trapped in an environment that you can't take with you or stuck in your TV. So the goal here is to have content that can be rented, that can be consumed the same way you would uh, linear media in the space. And the great part is it's a very low price point for the customer. It's a very low friction because it's direct to billing for the cable operator. Um, and it's a very attractive opportunity for content developers because you have a rental position that you've never had before. Someone can play your game today. They may want to play it two weeks from now. They may bring their friends over a month from now. And you're constantly in a cycle of, of revenue generation against that content. You quickly click the content. You enter your pin just like VOD. You hit OK. It immediately starts uh, downloading the game. You're able to play the game locally on the device. It's pretty turnkey. So that's kind of what it is. Again, if you go to the booth, you can kind of get a sense of it. But the marketplace, I think, in the connected TV space is, is pretty significant today. And it will only kind of go up that hockey, kit, hockey stick curve um, over the next while. Thank you. Great. That really opened uh, my eyes to a market I hadn't really thought about a, a lot. And uh, you certainly can take a lot of your, your titles and start moving it forward to this platform. We have um, time for questions. So uh, if you have some questions for the panel here. Come on. Surely you've got some uh, questions about how to get, get on board and expand your audience. Yeah. Uh, the question was how do scores, uh, competitions, tournaments, and things get exposed in this? Yeah, so, so currently what we have um, uh, live commercially is uh, uh, multiplayer, so people can play multiplayer locally or remotely on the same network. Uh, and uh, it's uh, quite easy for us to, hand, to add uh, competitions, um, um, pricing, uh, because this is handled by, by the carrier and they have a direct relationship with, uh, with the end users and also because it's handled on the, on the back end side. So um, this is very, I would say, agile and uh, very flexible uh, for us to, uh, to, um, to work on those kind of additions. And it's in the, it's in the roadmap uh, for the for next coming months. From our perspective, I mean, the, the platform itself has the ability to expand out to pretty much all social features. The key for us is trying to find a way to blend the opportunity to have what's already built in the game and expected by the game 
um, so that there's a common leaderboard potentially between the games and the device and the games in the, in the real world. And trying to find that right mix. Um, simple things that we do that make it nice and easy is if you rent a game for a day, you don't play for 24 hours straight. So you may want to play for a bit, stop, and come back maybe a week from now so we have saved games um, in behind. You can pick up where you left off or start again. And that kind of an experience, you can just imagine, you can kind of tile it out with all these social features and, and have that platform be as rich as you want and then tailor to each carrier's independent deployment. That answer that question? Other, other questions? Yes. How about uh, porting and developing your existing apps? Uh, especially, let's say if I have a Flash app, you know, how easy is it going to be to get it over? Um, so I can, uh, I'll start. Um, the typical starting point for most of the stuff within our landscape um, will be a C++ based game, uh, whether it's an embedded mobile game uh, or whether it's a D3D DirectX game. Um, those offer the, the kind of the richness and easy turnkey solutions for us. Eventually, we'll move into things like HTML5 and, and other areas. Um, Flash is, is definitely an area in some platforms um, or hardware providers that is better supported than others. Um, currently, in our environment, we kind of tend to, to steer away from it initially, um, but I think that'll evolve over time. Yeah, currently, Playjam is supporting um, Flash in terms of AS2 right now, but we'll move, be uh, moving to support AS3 going forwards. The porting process isn't that complicated. I think what you need to take into account is will this game work, certainly in terms of Play Jam, where we're going for kind of mass market distribution. So most of the games that are on our platform need to be able to work with a standard remote control. So you can have a great Flash game, um, but will that translate um, automatically to uh, Smart TV? Not necessarily. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you need to take a step back and go, you know what, rather than re-engineer this game, maybe this isn't right for Smart TV. But there are plenty of very, very simple games out there um, that work extremely well on our platform. And if you look at some of maybe the Atari titles, for example, the classic arcade games, those are absolutely phenomenally, um, you know, perfect for, for smart TV, up, down, left, right, and, 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 and select would work very well. Yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, the Jcluster platform does, I mean, doesn't support Flash currently, and it's, uh, it's mostly because of uh, content positioning, uh, uh, you know, vision we have. We are really targeting, I would say, uh, Casual from, uh, we were talking about midcore earlier with, with Blake. We are really targeting, I would say, the richer experience on the casual side. So we, we like 3D, we like to have rich graphical effect and special effect in our game. So that's why we, we don't support uh, Flash. But of course, Anthony's platform uh, likes Flash, and Flash is, uh, is very adapted for, for, for different usage, I would say. Uh, and uh, for JCluster, you can have access to our SDK, it's, it's using C. Uh, same um, than once what, what Paul was explaining here. And uh, so we have uh, many uh, interesting and uh, tier one studios who are currently using the JCluster SDK. The good news is that it's free and it's available on our website. So you should go and check. And as far as timelines, you're looking at a couple of weeks. Um, the great part about game development open tools is you guys know your code base so well. The ability to enable it or streamline small aspects doesn't take very long because you're if you look at an iPad game, if it's a C++ cross-platform iPad game, your resolution's there, your graphics are there. If it's touch screen, for the most part, those are easy in the platform to translate into mouse movements or optimize wand movements. Um, so you really don't have a lot of things. Your footprint's under 300 megs. I mean, you really start to get a game that's immediately transferable into this market with very, very low friction. Um, and then the question is, is it the right kind of gaming experience that you want on a 60-inch screen TV with your kids? Or is it the right kind of gaming experience you want to have for a five-minute game play that you could play for half an hour? And I think those are the questions with the open tools that allows you to start to push um, the boundaries of entertain me and allow me to interact versus force me to interact to get entertainment. And I think it's that, that blend that we'll see over the next little while in the TV space that'll change and you'll see the brands like Nickelodeon and, and Disney start to push those boundaries because um, they have a lot of content that people resonate with, but the interactivity is just kind of sitting there waiting to be taken advantage of. Yeah, it's a little bit like uh, you know the uh, in, in the old days of uh, digital distribution, many uh, publishers have the flash flash version that is monetized by advertisement, and then if you want to have the the deluxe experience, then you have to download it. So you continue to download it in the case of Transgaming, and in the case of J Cluster, it's just in the cloud. But that's uh, basically to give you to answer the question about technology.
Uh, I think uh, it seems we're coming back to the technology question uh, over and over, and I think it's pretty interesting that you, you all three of you have very different approach to uh, technology, everything from a native app to a, a hosted streaming solution uh, in the cloud and uh, a pr pr proprietary platform uh, in Flash. Uh, how do you see, um, or how do you uh, approach uh, growing the, the device base and sort of going to new platforms and and growing your services, um, and how do you tackle that technology fragmentation that is very, very, uh, uh, very much there uh, for the TV environment? I think for, for PlayJam, um, you know, we're not tied to a uh, specific um, carrier. We're not tied to a specific chipset. You know, we're walk working across the range with all of the um, the, uh, the major manufacturers, and they're really right now, sort of in the terms of lowest common denominator, two two types of um, environment, and one is Flash, and the other is HTML JavaScript. Um, so we don't have a very complicated sort of route to market, and what we have a very what we do have is a very clear route to. Um, 8 billion devices by 2015. So that's kind of really been our strategy. You know, we, we're, we're going out there, but we've got great um, agreements in place with those manufacturers that gives us um, pre, uh, primary placement on the, on the user interface of those, um, uh, of those platforms. Um, and as the technology employed within those devices change, then we can start to adopt um, more complex games. Yeah, so you have different ways of addressing uh uh, this issue, what we did as JCluster is we are answering it on the on the server side, and uh, I mean what we believe is that it's 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 the only way uh, to make it uh, in, I would say efficiently and uh, without be being a headache for for the developers because you just have to integrate the JCluster SDK once, and y your content is going to be able to run on connected TVs, on smart TVs, and it's going to run on your smartphone, and it's going to run on your PC, and it's going to run on your tablet as well. So it's, we are launching, so what, what you saw is the TV version, the PC version is launching in a couple of weeks, and uh, this is uh, working also on tablet and on iOS. So, uh, Paul? Yeah. So I mean, the, the, the simple philosophy, we have four pieces to the puzzle. Um, there's an agent and client, there's a UI, there's a network piece, and then there's the catalog. Um, all those pieces, other than the catalog, are agnostic. They can be pretty much in any environment. You're looking at, there's about three or four major players in the silicon space that are really going to define what's going on or who already define kind of the TV space. You know, people like Samsung are using ARM chips and people like, um, you know, Free are using, you know, Intel chips. And, and so we built the, the catalog in mind to allow the developer to build once and deploy many. And, and that philosophy is always a promise, but I think in this space it really comes down to a, a possible reality. Um, there are only a few things you need to optimize for. You can take care of a lot of those in the platform. Um, and the elements that if you could get the benefits of an iOS type market where you build something um, and know that it will play, but then get the benefits of kind of the Android market where it could be actually beyond just Apple uh, you know, hardware, I think that is where this TV marketplace will go. Um, and there's going to be you know, three or four major players. I think that the reason you know, it, it's kind of an odd and, and somewhat appropriate thing for us to all be together is this market has room for people to succeed. But it needs you know, the development community to realize that the opportunity is now to change the way in which you look at content in the 60-inch, 40-inch TV space um, and the same way you did in mobile. I mean, 2008 wasn't that long ago, and we were really not really knowing what we were going to do in mobile, and now we just have kind of blown right past it. This has to at least be given you know, 12 to 18 months, and I think the developer spending a few weeks on their content um, is a reasonable upside of effort to get into a space and start to explore the, the, you know, the financial opportunities. But we all, I think, are trying to make sure that you're not porting you know, 17 different Android SKUs um, you know, and, and trying to choose the right devices. We're, we're going to do that work for you. Yeah, hi. We make games that are in the 300 megabyte range, uh, puzzle, adventure, hidden object type thing. And I see uh, from your demographics that that might be something that they would go for. How do you handle the streaming aspect of something that large? And is that the kind of game that you're seeing uh, some potential um, on your platforms? Yeah, so I, I, I can adjust that anything, and we, we, we arbitrarily have you know, chosen a, a file size just based on time. I mean, it takes 300 megs to download over today's you know, modern day connections is, is really not a painful exercise. It's you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Um, so it's a decent file size experience for us. Um, and then, you know, managing that game, it's, it's pretty much a simple executable. Most of the devices in market have at least 
um, you know, four gig on board, uh, whether it's flash memory, some of eight, and then you have DVR cross set top boxes, which, you know, there's one terabyte drives out there for everybody who has, you know, everything under the sun to record. So I think no matter where you are, you can play within that, you know, 300 meg or less space. Uh, on the streaming side, you know, I'll yeah, so what's cool with, uh, with J-Cluster is you, you don't even need a hard drive. So basically, uh, we are taking care of everything. Uh, and regarding the quality of the stream, which is key uh, in cloud gaming, what we, are, what we have in partnering with the leading carriers in the world is that they guarantee a quality of service, which means that uh, uh, you will always have a good line and you will always have a good quality of experience uh, when you play on, on the cloud gaming. We're running a little short. We have time for maybe one more question. Does anybody have uh, a last question for the panel? Uh, multiple remotes, multiple players. Uh, is that an issue you guys have been dealing with? Yeah, so, so here. So here you have the, the, the remote controller from SFR. So it's, it goes with the box, so three million of that uh, on the French market. But uh, what we can do, and, and the beauty of the cloud is that actually this can be my, my next remote. And what I can do is it just can become a gamepad. And this gamepad can be connected to the TV. And it can be a great way of, you know, of making uh, the gaming experience on smart TV cool. Uh, and, and that's something that we are working on. Yeah, I think, I think the great part about this market is as is, is bad as it is that it's centralized by a bunch of carriers in many, many different areas like the United States, they're all in every business. So if they're selling Android devices and, and iPhone devices, and you can make a secondary download app that allows that to become a secondary, tertiary, or even fourth controller in the room beyond what's shipped with the product, I mean, you've now really just stepped up the game and made the, the barrier entry very low. It also helps to move a more expensive phone into market, which drives more wireless. I mean, at the end of the day, the customer's going to get the experience they want, but you are going to end up paying a little bit for it. Um, but the carriers, I think, have that ability to quickly expand the same way that we have tiered services today. You have a, I think you still have a non-HD box probably in market, but you can get DVRs and DVR plus and TiVo enabled. And you're going to have this tiered service or subsidized service based on where you need to go from controller to controller. Well, thanks, and thank you to the panel. I've learned a lot today, and I suspect a lot of uh, the rest of you have as well. Um, we have a, another uh, session coming up in just a few minutes so uh, on how to uh, get groupies for your game. Uh, so that should be very interesting. So uh, grab a cup of coffee and uh, we'll uh, stick around. Thank you. Thank you.